the Dallas Mavericks as a team bug me. Okay, they annoy me. They they irk me just just a little bit. Cause I mean, brother, I just don't think as a team they're that good, and I don't think that they're built the correct way to win playoff basketball. Now, yes, I know obviously they're in the second round and that a lot of people are very happy about them, but I just think overall the Dallas Mavericks, although their potential is so high, because you have a guy like Luka, who's one of the best players in the NBA, and I actually like Luka, and Kyrie Irving, another one of the best players in the entire NBA. You have two of these great guards on your roster, so your potential is through the roof. I just think that they did a very poor job of building a team around them for winning playoff basketball. Like I said, yes, they won the first round, but it also it was in a series where Kawhi did not play. They went six games against a very old James Harden, and Paul George looked like a beast. And I mean, it was a pretty even series, especially with Kawhi being out basically the entirety of it. So yes, they did make it to the second round, but it was against a much, much weaker than normal Los Angeles Clippers team. And one of the biggest things why I don't think this team is built for playoff basketball at a high level is because look at all the other best teams in the playoffs currently. You have teams like the Denver Nuggets, the Minnesota Timberwolves, and the Boston Celtics, and even the Oklahoma City Thunder. These are some of the best teams, top seeds, in the entire playoffs this season. And what do they have in common? Yes, they all have superstar level players on their roster, but all of them have extremely well-built teams from top to bottom. They play as a team, they all rely on each other very well, and when their six man comes in, they don't have that big of a drop off. And when one of their stars has to go in for some rest, their team doesn't fall off of a cliff. That cannot be said for this Dallas Mavericks team in any way, shape, or form. As if you look at the numbers for Luka Doncic, when he is on the court, the Dallas Mavericks are a plus 12. And when he is off the court so far in the playoffs, they are a negative 21. They completely fall off of a cliff when Luka Doncic isn't on the floor. Now, although I do not have the numbers in front of me for Kyrie Irving, I would imagine, although they're probably not as extreme, they are fairly similar as well because it is a huge difference when those guys are on the floor for this team than when they are off of it, which is not the same case for teams like the Denver Nuggets. When Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic have to come off, their team doesn't fall off of a cliff. They stay fairly similar, and the numbers reflect that. Same with Shea Gilders Alexander and the OKC Thunder, and I can almost guarantee you it's almost the same thing with Anthony Edwards and the Minnesota Timberwolves. And that is the difference between a playoff team and a team that is very talented but isn't a team in terms of playing together and all of them having high impacts as well. And to really just further this point, this year without Luka Doncic, the Mavericks are 4-8, and eight, and without Kyrie Irving, they are 11-13, and 13. and obviously if you combine that, that is a total for 15-21 and 21 when one of their two best players are out of the game, which makes it a 41.6% win percentage on the season, which is not great at all, especially when you are so heavily reliant on just one of those two guys, at least both of them playing or your records fall off of a cliff, that is not a good sign for a team in the playoffs because now you're an injury away from one of those to just getting absolutely obliterated or you're just one of them not playing well in one game from getting absolutely obliterated. And speaking of them not playing well, that is exactly what happened in the two games that the Dallas Mavericks lost. In both of those, Luka or Kyrie Irving went through a rough stretch which resulted in them in getting down by a ton of points. They weren't able to come back and they lost. And that is exactly what happened in those two games. Now, yes, although Luka and Kyrie are an amazing players and that's why they won that Clipper series because they were able to consistently enough in those games do enough to win it is going to be harder and harder to do that as your level of competition goes up and up and the level of impact that their role players have is even less and is even neutralized even more because of how much better the other team's guys are and that just way of play puts so much pressure on their stars that if they don't perform form they are going to lose and if they don't perform for the entire game for at least the four games of a series they are going to lose that series. So if someone figures out how to just slow down Kyrie or slow down Luka Doncic, they're almost screwed. And they're, that just puts so much pressure on them, it is almost impossible to win a championship playing that way and relying that heavily on just two players on your team. And the reason it is like that is because they have so many holes on this roster on this Dallas Mavericks team. It is insane. Like there's so many exploitable players on this roster is what I mean by that. The first hole that I'm going to be going into is going to be the fact that they have two extremely one-dimensional big men 
on their roster. They have Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford. Although both of them are extremely solid at what they do, which is blocking shots and rebounding the ball, neither one of them can even remotely create their own offense. Neither one of them can guard bigger bigs. Like, Zubak was giving them fits in some of those games, especially in game one. So their bigs cannot guard if the other team's big is really big. So they're just both so similar in what they can do, but they can't guard the perimeter. They can only block shots. They can only rebound. They can't make their own shot unless they're dunking the ball. And they really have almost zero impact on the offensive end besides being lob threats and pick and roll threats, which, yes, does help make your offense a little bit harder to guard. But when you don't have to worry about them dishing the ball into the paint and you basically have zero worry about him doing even a hook shot to score, that makes it way easier to guard them in any way, making a, a team that is so reliant on just two stars to do the majority of the scoring of the basketball that is always a negative thing because you always want as many wrinkles that a team has to deal with as possible to make it easier for your stars. And with having these two extremely one-dimensional big men as your two guys that you're going to have in your rotation for the majority of the time, it makes your offense a lot more stale and a lot easier to guard. And it's just one of those things that it would be very nice to have a big man that can just go out there and do other things. It's a big reason why you're seeing Maxi Kleber's minutes go up in this series. Because if you actually look at the numbers, both Gafford and Lively have lost minutes from their regular season averages and Maxi Kleber's averages have gone up in this series and that's because Maxi is so much better of a shooter and he can extend defenses out and that is why you're seeing him get more minutes opposed to the other two very one-dimensional guys and they've actually been more way more successful with Maxi on the floor opposed to their other two guys the problem is Maxi also cannot even sniff playing defense on the perimeter and he is also not big enough to guard other bigs on in the paint like Zubak so that is a problem as well but at least he brings a little bit more offensive versatility but then even with him when you bring him in now the lob threat is gone so it's really just kind of like pick your poison do you want a big that can have a lob threat and be good in the pick and roll or do you want a big that can do pick and pop but you no longer have the rim protection or the lob threat that the other guys provide so with them having so many one-dimensional bigs it has posed a little bit of staleness at times for this offense Another gigantic problem for this team is that they don't pass the ball the most. As in the first round, out of the 16 teams, they averaged the fifth least assists per game in the entire playoffs. And the only people they averaged more were the Phoenix Suns and New Orleans Pelicans. Both teams got swept, by the way. They went 0 for 8. So <laughs> that's not the most impressive teams to beat. The other ones were the Los Angeles Clippers, who they beat in six games. So, I mean, also not that impressive to average more than them. And then lastly, you had the Orlando Magic, who is a first-year playoff team in a very long time, extremely young, and lost their series as well. So the only teams they average more assists are all teams who lost their series and some of the worst playoff performances team-wise, as you could say, in Phoenix and New Orleans as well. So, I mean, not the best. And now they're now the averaging the least assist out of any teams that are still available they're averaging the least amount of assists out of any one of the playoffs and that is a major problem because playoff basketball when you how you want to play is the most team oriented and that's why you see teams like the Nuggets Oklahoma and Minnesota Timberwolves all playing so and even the Boston Celtics as well I know I probably didn't mention them earlier but they're definitely one of those teams like this they play extremely team oriented basketball plus being extremely talented, and that's what makes them so dangerous. The Dallas Mavericks are very talented on the top end of their roster, but due to the lack of ability by their other role players on this roster, their assist numbers are lower, which makes them a lot, a lot easier to guard, and that is a gigantic problem for this team going forward. And even further on this point of how badly assist matters, let's now compare the top three teams in assists per game. Those teams are the Indiana Pacers, the Denver Nuggets, and the Minnesota Minnesota Timberwolves. The Denver Nuggets won a championship last year, so you really don't have to talk about them. The Minnesota Timberwolves are looking like one of the best teams in the playoffs right now, and that is no coincidence that they are playing as a complete team, and that's why they are looking so good and have a combined record of 8-1. and one. And then the Indiana Pacers, although they're still a first-year playoff team in a very long time, they were still able to make it to the second round where they won in six games against the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, yes, I know the Bucks were far from healthy, it is still an impressive win for a, such a young team, or led by such a young guy, should I say, to make it to the second round of the playoffs in their first year making the playoffs together. That is a very impressive feat. So it's not a coincidence that the three highest assists per game teams are the ones 
who are winning and looking successful. Now, we'll say the Pacers are by far the worst out of those teams, and I don't expect them to make it to the conference finals because they play zero defense. But the passing alone and them getting their entire team involved on the offensive end has propelled them to get to the second round, and I think that is so, so important. And it's way more impressive to see that, and you have way more faith in a team where everyone is involved, and it makes it way harder to guard, opposed to a team like Dallas, who just has so much talent at the top end of their roster in Kyrie and Luka, that what that's what makes them successful and I just don't think you can win championships playing that way and not passing the ball very much and the last thing I really want to say is kind of the game plan is pretty much out on the Dallas Mavericks most teams you have to pick your poison but with the Dallas Mavericks you just have to put your best defender on Luka your second best defender on Kyrie tell them help them as much as possible on help defense and then just pray to God that Derrick Jones Jr. doesn't shoot as good as he did in the first round. Derrick Jones Jr., for the most part, is a terrible three-point shooter. So if he just goes back to normal and not how he was shooting in the first round, he would be a huge hole in that roster because he cannot shoot normally at all. And then you have guys like Derrick Lively and Daniel Gafford. Just don't let them dunk the ball. And they have zero impact on the game outside of blocking shots. And for modern-day NBA terms blocking shots isn't the most important thing on defense. I would say perimeter defense is more important. So if you switch one of them onto a guard like Jalen Brunson or anyone, then or just any guard in general, any playoff level superstar guard, they're going to get cooked on the perimeter. So you can just switch on them in the perimeter and you cook them. If So if you slow down Luka or Kyrie, you can abuse their role players you should be able to win that series, and if you're playing as a team on the offensive end, your offense should be a lot more efficient than their offense. So it shouldn't be that difficult for a high-level playoff team to beat them in a seven-game series consistently. Now, I'm not saying they're going to get rolled. I'm not saying they're going to get swept. I think Luke and Kyrie are good enough, and that's how good they are, to basically take two games off of anyone they play against. I just don't think against a super high-level playoff team, which they are now going to be starting to face in the Oklahoma City Thunder, I don't think that they're going to win that series, and I think OKC probably wins in six or seven games. And just because they play as a team, they have a better all-around team, and they are just way more built for playoff basketball. And that is just my opinion, and I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Do you agree with me? Do you think that the Dallas Mavericks are built for the playoffs? Do you think they're not? I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. If you'd like to point to like, button, subscribe, button, and that's a word to me, and I hope you have a blessed day, because I had a blessed day, so you need to have a blessed day. All glory to God. See you in the next video. Goodbye. Boo.